Hi, this is Paul. Uh, Rod sent me this video uh, pertaining to our ongoing series on our ongoing series on the marriage crisis, and it's a good video. And I watched the whole thing, and there's a ton in this video. I don't know how much time the weather is kicking up in Sacramento. We have a we had a, another donor step up to match the next ten thousand dollars with building, and given the fact that the windstorms are wreaking havoc with our roof, we may need it for more than a parking lot. But um, I'm going to try and make, do this as long as the power is on. And this video is is very honest and very good. Let's let's just jump into it, and I think I hope you'll see why. Again, and you. So I read your book. The Case Against the Sexual Revolution, I read it. It was, um, I would say, an uncomfortable book, right? It was an uncomfortable book to read. So it must have been an uncomfortable book to write. Anyway, maybe you could just inform my viewers about why you wrote it, why you wrote it, and kind of what your what your experience was going through it when you wrote it and, and uh, how it served you. There's really something about Tammy in these videos that I like. Jordan is Jordan. <laughs> Michaela is, is Michaela. Tammy is, um, she's, she's wonderfully, she's wonderfully secure in herself. She has a lot of questions. You, you don't have the sense that she necessarily has some huge agenda. She's sharing her thoughts. And, and, and for those of you who might imagine you know, I know that people want to sort of paint Jordan Peterson in, in the light of some of some conservative right winger. Uh, there's nothing about that with with Jordan and Tammy. Tammy is simply responding to the world and through her through her experience and as she's seen it. And this, which is very much how Louise Perry is um, is responding to the world. So let's let's get into this because there's a ton in here. Mm. Um, why I wrote it, there wasn't, um, there wasn't a single moment of, of decision making. I sort of wish there was because people often ask, I wish I had had a Damacy moment that would make a good story, but no, I, um, I have spent, um, all of my adult life really working in, in, in areas relating to this subject. I did anthropology and women's studies at university and I did, I worked at a rape crisis centre after leaving university and um, since becoming a journalist I've written around around the subject of... Um... Okay, what I, what I really like about Louise Perry is by all, by all sort of shallow narratives she should be um, the, the, the queen spokesman for feminism. She, she went to modern university. She got her degree in women's studies. She's been working in women's issues the whole time. And so you should imagine she'd be out there with the party line, but she's very honest, basically. And this is, this is what's really lovely about this video because both Louise and Tammy have this sense to them that they're not warriors in the culture war. They're just sharing with us what they have found in their life experience. Um, sex and men and women and relationships and crime and violence and all of the things that feed into the book. So it seemed in a way the natural thing to do to incorporate all of that really 10 years of, of writing and thinking into a single volume. I did think when writing it that I, part of my intention was to write the book that I wish that I had been able to read when I was 18 or so, mm. because I don't think that, I didn't think that book existed. And I, I, have a, I seem to have a very wide range of readers from people that I hear from, um, every possible political and demographic background. But I'm, I must say I'm always particularly pleased when I hear from young women who say that the book has resonated with them because they were the, they were the readers that I, largely had in mind um now, now i think part of why i've seen a number of i met louise perry she was at the tom holland event she was at this little dinner that we had afterwards i had a lovely conversation with her what i like about this interview not that the other interview she's been on she's had conversations with glenn scrivener she's had conversations with chris williamson she's she's had 
she's had a conversation with um, Michaela Peterson. I would imagine she'll probably get on Jordan at some point. But this conversation is just so low-key and relaxed and honest. It's much more like you're sitting around in a living room having a nice conversation with some people who are going to share their truth. And this is what they're doing. How did I find writing it? I, yeah, I don't think anyone's actually asked me that before. Because <laughs> it is a really... Um, it is a grim book. There are, there are, there are particularly, I think, particularly the middle chapters, and um, I wrote it largely while pregnant, mm. Um, mm. or between about. I signed the book deal when I was about six weeks pregnant, and then, um, and then submitted the manuscript when my son was about six months old. So it was all. That's very fitting. That sounds very fitting because of it, the subject matter that you were taking on motherhood, you know? That's yeah. that's kind of spiritual. That sounds spiritual to me. You know, how many women do we see on YouTube who are sharing their thoughts and ideas do so as mothers? My matrescence, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And uh, I must say that it's not an it's not an easy life trying to finish a book when you've got a little baby. So I wouldn't. It was it it, it had a. I think it did um, throw the subject into 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 sharp relief in a way that probably helped, but it was also um, difficult and stressful. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend anyone take on those two projects at the same time. <laughs> um, I will try and I'll try and time my fertility in my next book a little bit more carefully <laughs> next time. Um, but. Uh, but yes, I mean, I think that I think it probably um, enriched my thinking, mm -hmm. in the sense that it, it there is something about having children that forces you to think about the future, mm -hmm. um, and to very personally invest in the future. Um, so, it, so possibly being pregnant and having my lovely son did encourage me to to be. I don't want to say more optimistic, but more future orientated. Mm -hmm. I think. Well, it, I wonder if it also uh, makes you more mindful of not having your son, of not being pregnant, and following through with the pregnancy and having that child while you were writing this book. Because that's part of that's the other side of the subject is that we don't have a family and we don't have our kids, and what. You know, with, with the mistakes that we make and the choices, the unguided, misinformed choices that we all come into contact with, especially when we're very young, especially if we've left uh, our community and then are, we're out on our own and don't have those, those solid, informed voices to uh, bounce our ideas off of, you know. It, it's very tricky for young women to find their way. I know I was young once and it was very tricky for me. I, I was very, I left home when I was 18. I said, goodbye, mom and dad, I'm, I'm out of here. I, I'm gonna take on my life, you know? And, and then, you know, I did, I took on my life and I bumped up against it a lot and didn't have and wouldn't because of being proud, reach out to my family, but they were like 3,000 miles away. So w young women now today find themselves really on their own and making these decisions. And I imagine that's some of those people that you talked to in the rape crisis center were women who had made decisions and gone places and not had that mm, security that family or close friends or you know community can give you. Verveke talks about domicide. A lot of what's happened in the later 20th century, beginning of the 21st century, is loss of home, loss of community, loss of family, loss of networks. And Tammy just points out the resulting loss of wisdom with those losses. And see, this isn't unintentional. I've, I've often 
I've often mentioned the, the video, The Merchants of Cool. It, it's a bit dated now. It, it came out in 2001. But marketers, a lot of people had a lot to gain by taking advantage of the naivety of the young and developing what would become a youth revolution whereby parents would um, would lose a, a, a great degree of, of control and influence over their children and young adults would go out into the world and they would become fodder for those who prey on especially young people and young women because in many ways you can get stuff out of young women you don't get out of young men and that market is there so what was what was the population of people that that you would see and how old were they mostly when you were answer when you were in the crisis center um i did a few different roles over my period there um so answering the helpline and training volunteers to answer the helpline, which is the whole range of, of, of service users. And I went into schools to teach consent workshops, which is something I write about quite a lot in the book, my own sort of complicated feelings about consent workshops. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I also worked one-on-one -on -one with teenage girls. Um, so... I mean, when on when? How old were the girls? The teenage girls? Fifteen to eighteen. Fifteen to eighteen. Oh, yeah. yeah. So yeah. that. I mean, most rape victims are in that age. I didn't know this before I started working there, and and and, and actually not really until later when I started looking into the numbers more on this. Um, and and this also took me by surprise. Generally speaking, I think culturally we have a mental picture that rape is something that happens on a dark alley with a woman walking unattended assaulted by a stranger and i'd never thought about it but if you think about it what she lays out makes absolutely perfect sense and has everything to do with the destruction of the family and the loss of the family unit making now young girls vulnerable in um in in ways that quite frankly was quite preventable. There is a ton in this video about the loss of family and the loss of culture and the loss of familial institutions and the good that those institutions did for generations of individuals. Um, the modal rape victim is 15. The, right. the, they're a lot younger than people I think tend to assume and the proportion of rape victims who are over the age of 30 is in the single digits percentage wise. Right, so the kids that are 15 are sometimes still at home. So they yeah. still are in their communities. They still have their parents around. But, you know, as you said in your book, is rape a power or a sex-driven crime? Uh, boys that are, I mean, how old are the men, I wonder, that are doing the assault? Also, also young, probably. Uh, about, also under 20? Yes, I can't remember the figures off the top of my head, yeah. but yeah, definitely skewing in that direction. I mean, the, yeah. it's one of the pieces of evidence, I think, for rape being motivated by power, by, excuse me, the, the classic feminist line from the second wave is mm -hmm. um, rape is about power, not about sex. It's not the idea being it's not about sexual desire, it's about politics really um yeah i don't think that's true there are some cases where i think that's probably true you know if you look in the workplace for instance you never see junior men sexually harassing senior women the sexual harassment right. always goes in one direction so i think that in, in in cases like that you can see that there is clearly power at play um in that power offers opportunities for harassment but i don't think in general that is true or not the whole story one of the very good pieces of evidence for that is that the the age of victimization for girls or girls mostly and women tracks pretty much perfectly the age of peak sexual desirability mm -hmm. and the age of perpetration for men and boys tracks pretty much exactly um the peak of sex drive mm -hmm. i don't think you can really explain that through the power analysis i think you have to be thinking about this as 
an aggressive expression of sexual desire. And if you think in those terms, then my argument is that we need to be thinking quite differently about what the solutions are to sexual violence. Um, because the, inter the, the interventions that are generally proposed by feminists are all ideological. It's all to do with teaching boys in particular at younger and younger ages, um, teach them feminist politics essentially, and, and hope that this will prevent sexual violence. I don't think that it will. Teaching feminist politics will curb young men's um, sexual desire. <laughs> yeah, I can see why she left there thinking, no, this is dumb. Well, um. well yeah, I met a woman... Let's see. We have been on book tour for a long time, so I can never remember which city I was in most recently. <laughs> but I met a woman who's in in Berlin. That's where I met her, Berlin, and she's a very she's an outspoken uh, woman, doing her part to try to bring truth to journalism. Uh, she said that when her daughter was her oldest was a daughter, so her oldest child was a girl, and so she took her for self. Um, what do you call it? Self. Um, defense. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip around a little bit. And, you know, we used to have people, young women, were always with a family member. Yeah. Until they were married. Yeah. And this then is... those kind of things were less likely to happen. But that was then, and this is now. And you know the, and like you said, the moral framework has disappeared. And now there's a. There's a show on Hulu that I've been watching at the recommendation of, of Han Shu. The, the title of this is Rami on Hulu. I'll just plug it in there. It's a, it's a very interesting... Um, there's three seasons of it. I'm in the first season. It's a very interesting show about religion and family amongst... Uh, immigrant Egyptian Muslims in northern New Jersey. And the episode that my wife and I just watched last night pertained to uh, Rami's sister, who she was complaining to Rami. She's 25. She feels just completely controlled by her parents. And she's and he's just like, well, just don't listen to your parents. Just walk out and do your own thing. And what's so interesting about this show is that so many of the issues involved do track with this um, with this conversation because it's there's there's also in that show a lot of talk about sort of the general population so the young Muslim Muslim men are going out and having sex with white women um, the 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 Muslim young women are sort of caught in this question about well, should they be going out and having sex, or should they be, um, should they sort of hold the line on this um, on this traditional sexual ethic that you wait until marriage? There's a lot going on in this show. The show is rather explicit, and so those of you who don't want to see, or it's it's not visually explicit as much as it's frank about a lot of a lot of distasteful sexual behavior I'll say that but all of these issues that these two are dealing with here are very much in that show and again what I love about this conversation this is a frank honest conversation between two women who are sharing two women that you would expect where they came from, who they've been with, that both of these women, neither of them from the United States, by no means from the Bible Belt, that both of these women would be big cheerleaders for feminism. This is a brutal takedown of what the feminist sexual ethic has done to especially young girls and young women 
in our culture. It, and what's amazing is that this is a brutal takedown without gotchas and mockery and boasting. It's it's just a pretty amazing conversation. Yeah, kin, yeah. kin, kin groups are very protective. Mm-hmm. And um, one theory which I think is, is probably has a lot of truth to it is that feminism, particularly in relation to fears of sexual violence and domestic violence, tends to arise in situations where kin groups are disintegrating. When you have, say, urbanisation, you have a lot of young women coming to the city and not having any protective group around them. I mean, one Mm. category of women who have always been painfully, painfully vulnerable to sexual violence in particular are servants. Mm. Thinking of, say, 19th century Britain, where you have a lot of internal migration, you have a lot of women, very young women and young men, coming from um, rural areas into the city to work in service. Um, you know, within the homes of strangers. The, 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 this is exactly the sort of situation where um, young women are acutely vulnerable because actually king groups, you know, yes, king groups do um, perpetrate their own abuse sometimes. You know, we can't idealise mm-hmm. the family, the extended family. But also there's a level of loyalty there that is really, really hard to replicate otherwise. And that that basic you know if you mess with me my brother my cousin my father etc you'll have them to answer for if that's not available anymore you can understand therefore why lots of women finding themselves in that situation which of course university does as well we we deliberately displace young people from their kin groups particularly when you have the residential university system as the norm which isn't true in all countries but is true here and in many other places um when you are displacing women from those protective contexts you can see why um, feminist politics would arise as a response to that, that increased mm-hmm. feeling of vulnerability. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, the university, that's... Now, a- again, <laughs> these, are not, these are not Bible Belt women. Um, who would, um, Tammy, of course, is exploring Roman Catholicism. Um, uh, Louise is, is not a, to... Um, she's not publicly, at least... A, and a, a overtly religious person. She, her arguments are not religious. If you want to read a really good treatment of her book, Richard Beck, who's one of my favorite bloggers, has been doing a series on her book, The Case Against the Sexual Revolution. And and it's tremendous. Well, I, I think uh, Richard Beck's blog itself is tremendous. And um, he, he, does a, he does a superb treatment with her book. It's a very, that's a, that's a quite a place where bo- both boys and girls are taken from their kin groups and so that they don't have what would be an external monitoring okay now don't want to interrupt it's, it's a little ironic that i say that the point that she made about feminism was important and again i think there's a a, a lot of honesty and nuance here there are reasons she meant she she talked about 19th century industrialization the rest is history had an excellent episode on industrialization industrial this this shredding of the the institution of the family has been happening for a very long time and in many ways the nuclear family as such father mother and children the nuclear family disconnected from broader kinship and familial ties is a product of modernity and a product of the industrial revolution and you can understand feminism as a result of that shredding of the institutions to try to embed in state power alternative means of doing a lot of what the family had done before. And and so it's that way that you can't just say, you know, family good, feminism bad. The, The story is much more nuanced. The story is much more complex because feminist structures and feminist thinking sort of rose in an attempt to respond to the kinds of disruptions and the kinds of sufferings that were happening as a result of modernity and the sexual revolution. And so, but what we are seeing now is that many of these attempts have have simply not played out and some of the dogmatic commitments made 
particularly by what we've seen in terms of Marxist feminist thinking, is very much showing itself to be, at least in the opinion of these two women, um, not good for us. Of their behavior and bumping pads to bump up against, that, that's all gone all of a mm. sudden. Mm. Yeah, and we don't, and we never even th thought of that, you know. We never, through the 70s, when my sisters and I left home, my brother left home, we never thought of all those things. We just left. It wasn't, we didn't even feel vulnerable. We never even thought of those things. And we went from a re really rural, my the town I grew up in was 2,000 people, 400 miles from a large city, right? Really, really rural. And you were so excited to leave home because you'd never seen any of the world. So these kids, by 15, I was ready to leave home. I can see why 15 is really the time, you know, girls have uh, got their period, so they're women. By 15, all pretty much all girls are women, right? And then, oh, I've been thinking of status. So I have this theory, so let's see how this goes. So status in men is pretty easily defined, right, of uh, economic status usually. So, and, and men, you know, they fight, fight for position and put someone comes to the top. She, she has to sit and listen to Jordan talk about this thing every night on the book tour. So she, uh, she's, been, she's been schooled in Jordan's, um, in Jordan's ideas. And it's decided among men. But what is the status among women? Where does that come from? And I've always been thinking, where does that status come from? What do you think? I have a theory, but I want to hear yours. <laughs> so some of it is in, a, is in association with with men. It's it's from the it's from your mate or mm -hmm. from your father, which or whichever is your closest male kin. Um, I think some of it also in traditional societies, at least, comes from motherhood and grandmotherhood. It is one of it is one of the payoffs in a traditional society. Yes, you have to do an extraordinary degree of work and self sacrifice in your um, in your when you when you when you progress from maiden to mother. But the payoff at the end of it is you get to be matriarch, mm -hmm. um, which is something. Now, Mary Harrington wrote a piece. Right, let's see if I can find it. Uh, she wrote a lot of pieces. It was this one that I'm thinking of. Uh, middle-aged women, um, middle-aged women don't want sex. It was the, it was the, it was the cronehood word that that caught my attention. Of course, Mary Harrington has has written about this in a in a variety of forms, um, but it's a similar similar point. Thing that you you do lose in a society which is less orientated around motherhood and children. Mm -hmm. um, That's a good point. Mm. What do you think? What do you think the female well, status Well, I'm comes thinking from? of young women, status mm. of young women, and how you can maintain status, or even increase your status, or and how can, and how you can lose your status as a young woman. And I've been thinking. I don't know what you think about this, but when girls are young, when they're 13, 14, 15 and starting to become desirable, sexually desirable in the, in the public place, as long as they're virgins, their status is maintained. But as soon as they, as soon as they lose their virginity, then they're out of that same, they're not in that status game anymore. Now they belong in a way to a different category, which is girlfriend. So she's so she's taken what might have been her own independent status, and now it's now it's in a way they're not married, but it's transferred to the person that she's involved with, and that can happen. Now it happens. As now, now again, if you want to look for an example of this, um, the the Virgin Queen Elizabeth the First. I mean, she was um, she was she was able to manage. I don't know about her virginity, but at least her desirability for mate. She was able to manage that and um, and and use that for the for the rise of status of a nation. As soon as a woman loses her virginity, and that can happen, I don't know how young, you know, young. And so from then on, if, if so, if you stay a virgin, so I was just thinking about this in the last few weeks, you can maintain that status as long as you're a virgin until you're married. And 
that status is meaningful. It's meaningful. And something that we have almost lost sight of, how meaningful that status can be. What do you think of that? I, I think that's an amazing point. I think that's an absolutely amazing point. And I know I, I know how people are going to respond to that point, that it's unfair. And you know what? It may be, but it's still true. There's a lot to life that is unfair but true. Um, you might tell men, young men, that if they, um, if they hit the weight room and exercise and stay physically fit and eat right, you can tell old men that too, then um, you know they'll have all that status. And you might decry that it's unfair that I have less status because my body isn't, um, that my body isn't ripped or shredded or um, how, how, many other, how many other words you want to have that I have a dad bod. Um, I do have a dad bod, a five times dad bod. Um, maybe that's a little bit too much information. I don't know. But again, this, this, is, this, is just, this, this is just amazing. Tammy Peterson just saying, hey, you know what? This is true. And, and she's right. It is true. The kind of homosocial status in that you're, mm -hmm. yeah, that you're assessed purely in terms of your position within the female mm -hmm. hierarchy rather than secondhand from your men folk. Mm -hmm. I think that's true. I think that the, I think that a very very strange feature of our sexual culture, which is now, I don't think Louise really wants to touch this. I don't think she wants to touch it because she's pretty courageous for writing the book that she wrote, but. You'll you'll get a you'll get a world of pushback on the point Tammy just made. Probably sets us apart from any other sexual culture that I'm aware of is that girls don't prize their own virginity in status terms. Mm -hmm. um, now this too is another amazing point. I think their parents do. I don't think and and other people, teachers, you know, I don't think that. And, it, and if you look at that episode, I'll find it. It's episode six in season one, Refugees, where where Rami's sister decides that she's basically, she's 25 years old and she basically wants into the sexual marketplace and she wants um, she wants to be liberated from the, from the rule of her parents and she's going to go out there and she's going to lose her virginity and she's going to do it with whomever she wants, even if it's a white guy. And it's, it's a good episode. Adults are eager at all for, say, 13-year-old girls to be sexually active. I don't think that... Um, I think, actually, parents are gen and adults are generally appalled. But girls nowadays, if they're... Um, if they're really in... I mean, one pushback I've had on this book is, is, is some people suggesting that what I'm describing here, the culture, the hookup culture and so on, is really confined to only a tiny number of progressive enclaves, you know, a few universities or whatever. I don't think that's true. I think it is extremely widespread now. And actually, the, mm -hmm. excep the exceptions are a handful of generally religious communities that are unusually, I agree. unusually mm -hmm. traditional. In pretty much everywhere else, adolescent and teenage girls now experience their virginity as a burden that is embarrassing and that they want to be rid of. And I don't think that they, I don't think girls of any other generation felt that way. Um, they clearly felt sexual desire. I mean, I think, you know, I, 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 the idea of, of, of girls and women being these completely sexless creatures is clearly false. Um, but this eagerness to be participating in in adult sexual relationships, um, particularly casual sexual relationships with no no connection to marriage, no route towards marriage. Mm -hmm. I don't think the girls ever previously felt that. And I don't think it's as simple as there being, I don't want to use terms like false consciousness. I don't think this is to do with any sort of top down conspiratorial ideology to sort of to keep women down I quote my grandmother mm -hmm. at, in the conclusion when when I when I told my grandmother about my argument in the book and she said um women have been conned she said it very darkly um it's not quite it's, it's a good line it's not quite true because I don't think that anyone has done the conning um I think it's just that the pill has really really upended our us and this gets into I just watched uh I haven't quite finished Jonathan Peugeot and John Verveke's it was supposed to be a promotion of after Socrates, but I knew once they get into the um, 
extended that get into the question that those two always want to talk about they go there but you know what 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 kind of conspiracy is this um what who has conned the women um our heterosexual relationships um and we now have slightly perverse incentives in place which encourage quite strange behavior but um this kind of drive that young women feel now to be more masculine in their sexuality against i would argue their deeper instincts um i think is very historically strange and yes i suppose offers a it, uh, what's difficult I, I think about it from the teenage girls perspective because these are you know these are girls who have really no experience of the world and and are very easily very easily misunderstand social signals and so on and are extremely groupish i mean we know that teenage girls are always the first group to to experience any kind of contagious mental mm -hmm. illness mm -hmm. um, because they're very, very socially attuned, um, desperately, desperately concerned with social status and therefore very impressionable among their peers. And so this is why you have things like, um, well, there's a long list of, of, of contagious mental illnesses among teenage girls, anorexia, gender dysphoria, um, Salem, Salem witch trials, you know, whatever, whatever yeah. you want to mention. Um, they have this really difficult balance where on the one hand, being promiscuous is seen as a means of status because it is a, is a way of displaying the fact that you are attractive to men and that you are um, adult and sophisticated. So it has, so it has to some degree office status, but it's very, very fragile sort of, I think there's a tightrope that has to be walked where if you are too promiscuous, then you end up actually being rejected as, as a potential long-term partner by men. Um, mm -hmm. But if you're frigid, prudish, whatever, then you end up also being, um, also losing status. Mm -hmm. It's very, very, very difficult. And I think really, really difficult for girls to strike that balance. A very common mm -hmm. experience for teenage girls nowadays, which I didn't experience because I was a little bit too old. We didn't have, I'm 30, so we didn't have smartphones until I was in my late teens. But for kids now who are getting smartphones when they're 10 or 11 or younger sometimes, um, sending nudes has become mm -hmm. an incredibly difficult terrain to navigate because what girls say is on the one hand they get a lot of pressure from boys, you know, they'll have a, this, a very attractive high status boy who asks who asks for nude and that's it's like great that's a route to status that's a, a route to being um to being liked maybe becoming his girlfriend all of this but then always in the background is the risk that, that those photos will be shared through the school and then mm -hmm. her status drops catastrophically so they're just the, the the game that they are playing without really understanding the rules without really understanding how everyone else um the true feelings and motivations of everyone else involved is so painful, so difficult for boys as well, but the but the the level of risk to girls, I think, is different. From now, the level what do you think? What do you think of schools that are same-sex schools rather than mixed schools? Do you think it makes any difference? And then they'll go on and talk about that. This was that both of those issues, both of the 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 data I did not know about the prevalence of young rape on both the um, both the victim and the perpetrator, that as a function of the, the disruption of, first, I think, in the beginning of the Industrial Re Revolution, the, the, the broad kin family, the big, the big family, and then now even the nuclear family disrupted, and the difficulty of new institutions to come in to replace with as much with as much efficiency really and, and cost effectiveness as the family has done and then this other question about um, sex and status and young girls <laughs> yeah listen to the whole interview the whole conversation is just really lovely and this i think is for me the, my favorite Louise Perry interviews that I've seen here. Tammy is just honest. She's sharing. You know, you don't have the sense that she, you know, she 
she's just telling us what she thinks. And I know some people are just not going to like it. So that's why the comment section is there. Go ahead and have at it in the comment section if you'd like. But I, I found I found this to be a profoundly moving, honest, insightful conversation. And I think way more people should see it.